You're watching Baptist Health's Resource Live, where our respected experts bring you timely and practical health and wellness information to improve your family's way of life. We're healthcare that cares. This is Resource Live. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Jonathan Fialco, Chief Population Health Officer from Baptist Health South Florida, and we're coming to you live from the Baptist Health Newsroom. The simple act of breathing is something we don't think about until it's hard to do. We take about 22,000 breaths a day, and we're inhaling oxygen, which we need to supply our body, and we exhale toxins, toxins like carbon dioxide. In November, we observe National Awareness Months for both lung cancer and COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And this year, the COVID-19 pandemic has focused even more attention to the health of our lungs. So today, we're gonna to talk about lung-related illnesses. From smoking to cancer to COVID and other issues related to the lungs, we have two expert physicians with us, and I'd like to welcome at this point, Dr. Mark Deluski, Chief of Thoracic Surgical Oncology at Miami Cancer Institute and the Medical Director for Robotic Thoracic Surgery at Baptist Health, and Dr. Javier Perez Fernandez, a pulmonologist and critical care director at Baptist, House, at Baptist Hospital. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, folks, before we dive into today's subject, I want to remind our viewers to send any questions or comments you have through the segment. We're here for you and happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, let's start by talking about the scope of lung disease, guys. Again, many different components, many different disease. Um, I want each of you to talk about kind of the lung disease of specific populations. So first, I'm going to ask you, Mark, to talk a little bit about lung cancer, uh, which is very prevalent and obviously uh, and the focus of, of, of this month's uh, awareness, national awareness as well. And then, Javier, we'll turn it over to you about COPD um, and its relationship to uh, lungs and chronic disease as well. So, Mark, let, let's start with, with lung cancer. What can you tell us about lung cancer in 2020? So lung cancer um, is the third most common cancer um, in the U.S. and around the world but it accounts for the majority of deaths, both in men and women, both in the United States and around the world. So it's a critical issue. And we haven't, um, as of yet, uh, made huge strides in improving the, the, the long-term survival and the overall survival in patients with lung cancer, but we're making strides in that effort. Um, there's a, uh, the treatment algorithm involves a complexity of treatments such as uh, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, and it's often a multidisciplinary approach to managing these folks. So it is encouraging to hear about the advancements in treating lung cancer, and, and we will elaborate on that a little bit later. Um, and we'll also give you an opportunity to talk about detecting lung cancer in the community, um, but we'll start with some preventive components. Um, Javier, um, speaking of preventive components, let's talk a little about COPD against level setting for the conversation. What is it? How widespread is it? What are the consequences to our, our society and our healthcare system? Sure, an amazing, an amazing approach to this, and, and thanks so much for the opportunity. I think uh, certainly a COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is uh, a disease that's caused by uh, insult to the airway, and essentially the most common insult is smoking. And uh, it produces essentially a narrowing of the airway, and it presents typically after 20 years or so of uh, being a smoker, and, and it produces significant uh, people. It's, it's the most common uh, chronic pulmonary disease for adults. And it's certainly uh, something important. It's the fourth leading cause of death in the US and, and accounts for the significant number of people affected. Over 24 million people in the US are affected with COPD. And it's probably one of the most rapidly raising diseases because worldwide, and, and that reason is again, because although smoking is being more, mostly contained in the US, it's certainly not contained in other countries. And that's what really every day we see more prevalence of the disease. So a, a tremendous uh, handicap for patients and, and certainly is, is a very important preventable disease, of course. So um, COPD is emphysema and chronic bronchitis there. Can you describe the, the symptoms or the recognition of the two components of COPD? That, that's correct. Uh, what, what happened is historically, we have divided that into emphysema and, and, and what we call chronic bronchitis. Every day, we tend to mo move more towards just the disease itself because most of the patients contain or have both diseases in, in, in one person. Now, the typical emphysema, which essentially is a destruction of the lung inside the walls, the little walls inside the lung are getting destructed uh, uh, day after day, and it produces obviously big balloons inside the chest. And the chronic bronchitis, which is mostly uh, the thickening of the airway and the production of smoking, I mean, of, of mucus blocks and, 
and a lot of uh, secretions, but those really are coexisting in most of the patients. And uh, unfortunately, they're very difficult to distinguish one and another. I think the two words that I really wanted to highlight here are, again, they're both preventable. So COPD is a preventable disease, but also it's treatable. So we do have a significant number of tools nowadays to treat the disease and make people <laughs> life close to normal. And, and again, this is very important because uh, for years, we always, always understood that COPD was uh, no cure for it. And again, it's totally treatable and we can definitely uh, make improvements on quality of life. Which speaks to the preventable component, because if I can hear, which is if I read into what you're saying, it's not curable, but you can ameliorate the symptoms in someone who has it to at least establish a quality of life, but they're not going to remove it. They're not going to, they're not going to cure it or get back to normal lungs. Is that, is that a problem? Right. And, 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 but this is also very important our, our uh, listeners and our viewers to understand the concept of uh, curable. I mean, hypertension, which is a disease that you're obviously extremely familiar with, is not curable. Right. It's treatable. It's totally. So you're not going to get rid of the hypertension. You're not going to get rid of the COPD, but you can make life totally normal with the treatment. <laughs> and obviously the best circumstances are to prevent it. Um, I'm going to wear my cardiologist hat a little bit and just say, if someone has hypertension from a multitude of factors and they improve those factors, lose weight, exercise, it can go away. But if you have hypertension, don't change the thing. It's always going to be there and you just control That's it. Right. A little That's cycle, right. but, but you're absolutely, but COPD, the damage is permanent, but we can mitigate yeah. the symptoms. So uh, again, before we get to right. smoking, which I do need to spend time on, what are the symptoms arguably that we would pay attention to for COPD, early symptoms that might say, of course, I got to get rid of what may be causing it, which will be smoking, which we'll get to, like I said. But what would bring it to a pulmonologist? And I'll follow up, Mark, to ask you specifically, what are the kind of symptoms that might alert someone to say, I'm going to get checked out because I want to make sure I don't have lung cancer? So, Javier, I'll start with the symptoms more for our COPD. Javier, did we lose you? Yeah. So, Mark, I'll follow up with you. Can we speak to um, the symptoms that might make someone uh, seek help to make sure they don't have lung cancer? Absolutely. And, and you know, there's a, everybody's aware of the correlation between using tobacco products and COPD and emphysema and lung cancer. Um, and unfortunately, many of the symptoms that are present in patients who've been smoking, such as coughing and shortness of breath and dyspnea, are components of, a, of development towards lung cancer. And, un, and one of the unfortunate things is that the COPD and the emphysema cloud the picture, the diagnostic picture of patients who present with lung cancer. Very few lung cancer patients have symptoms other than a shortness of breath and a cough. And, it, and what happens is over time, the tumors in the uh, lung begin to grow. And then in very advanced stages, when the tumor be becomes large enough to start eroding into the vessels and eroding into the airway, you start to get these advanced symptoms such as hemophysis, which is coughing up blood. Uh, you can develop um, chest discomfort or chest pain when the masses start eroding into critical structures in the chest and the chest wall. So one thing to remember is that patients who develop symptoms in lung cancer, it's often it's in advanced stages, stages that are such advanced that it's hard to treat and cure those folks. So the important thing is to identify patients at risk for lung cancer. And the most efficient and cost-effective way of treating lung cancer is to identify patients with those risk factors and screen those patients. Remember, I, one point, we do have a cure for lung cancer. It's screening the patients and catching them early in its earliest stages and then offering them appropriate surgical care. That's well said. So we, lung cancer is curable when you find it early. So- right. So to that end, in your practice, and again, you have a very high uh, skill set in treating, uh, surgically treating lung cancer, what percent of the patients that you see would you say are found in an early screening procedure with a potentially curable situation or more advanced where it might be something that may be curable, but more palliative? Where in that spectrum of the uh, early detection to the I'm coughing blood and really short of breath, do you see the patients that get to you? So in the last five to 10 years, we've made great strides in identifying the patients at risk for lung cancer and implementing national strategies around screening. So historically, the majority of patients that were diagnosed with lung cancer in the United States were in its stage three and stage four. That used to be about 60 to 70 percent of patients. And that is changing with the implementation of screening with CT scans. 
And we're catching more and more patients in the earlier stages, stage one and two, where surgery can have an impact at curing those patients. That's, that, that's, that's a good, great trend and, and good to hear. Um, so screening, if we want to get into that a little bit more, um, uh, let's talk about screening a little bit. Does someone have to be symptomatic to qualify for screening? Do they have to have a cough or shortness of breath? Absolutely not. The main criteria for screening is whether they are a tobacco user or not, whether they've spoke, smoked for more than 15 years, and whether they have quit less than 15 years um, prior to uh, seeing their doctor. And we've limited the age group um, to up between 55 and 80, knowing that patients who are younger than 55, if they're actively smoking, are less likely to develop cancer uh, until they reach the mid 50s. And patients over the age of 80 are, are less likely to acquire cancer and have it impact their longevity of survival. So we limit it to a population between 55 and 80, and that where, that's where the cost effectiveness has the most impact in screening patients. And what is that screening methodology? What is screening entail? So there, there's a number of methodologies that we've used in the past, but the most sensitive and accurate is using a, uh, what's called the low-dose CT of the chest, a CAT scan of the chest. Um, and typically, we recommend that being started after the age of 55 if you're actively smoking or if you've stopped less than 15 years prior. And that should be done annually as long as the, C the original screening CT scan does not show an abnormality. Okay. If there's an abnormality, then those uh, screening protocols may change and, and they may be implemented to do it more frequently, or they may, there may be a trigger to start evaluating the patient for an, act, uh, an active suspicious lesion that may be cancer. So a low dose, low radiation dose, safe, cheap CAT scan is the screening procedure of choice for that people for that population that meets that criteria to possibly find a cancer early before symptoms, which would make it much more likely to be curable. Absolutely, it. absolutely, and have the biggest impact. Just to make a point, many of our viewers realize that there's a tremendous amount of money spent treating patients with advanced cancer developing chemotherapy, developing different types of radiation and immunotherapy. And there's billions of dollars spent by medical and pharmaceutical companies to this end. The biggest and the cheapest impact that we can have on patients who potentially develop lung cancer is to catch them in its earliest stages. Well said, well said, prevention. Um, Javier, I promise folks we will get to smoking specifically because I think tobacco is such an important uh, topic as it relates to lung disease and our awareness um, 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 efforts. Um, but Javier, let's take the same tact for, for COPD. In your practice, what's the level of advanced COPD you see? Is the person at end stage by the time they get to you? Are we successful in picking up early signs and, and making an impact in the person uh, over the last few years? Tell us a little bit about that trajectory. Sure, and I'm gonna actually copy some of the uh, the Mark's uh, words on, on saying a few of uh, of the concepts here as well. Um, there is preventable issues over COPD, and unfortunately, the time that we need typically see patients with COPD are when symptoms are well developed, and the, the typical symptoms are again the dyspnea, uh, which starts on insertion and it goes up to even uh, resting. The significant cough spasms that affect people with production of mucus and obviously the inability to perform most of the normal activities or regular activities. That's the moment people are seeking the medical attention and 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 uh, they're really they're really hunger for air, right? They're, they're really they really need help to breathe, and that, and that's very unfortunate because then most of the damage, as we mentioned before, is already uh, done and and it's unfortunately non recoverable and. If we catch COPD in an earlier stages, if we're able to identify in a similar way, the same population, because again, it's the same common factor, which is if you're a smoker, if you've been a smoker for over 15 years, whether you have symptoms or not, but if you are a smoker, uh, there is a tool that we can use to prevent or to identify patients at risk and also patients who develop early stages of COPD is called spirometry. It's a simple test that's not required any intervention does not require any punctures, does not require any, any invasion. It's a simple test that's flowing into a little machine that uh, most of uh, the pulmonologists uh, have it in their offices and also in the hospitals and all, all Baptist hospitals have it. 
uh, a pulmonary laboratory that we can do that. And in, in those particular events, you can actually do this test that takes five to 10 minutes to perform and identify whether you have the earliest stages of COPD or at least screen people to determine whether they're affected or not. And, and that's obviously an important issue. And the second most important factor in COPD is also the establish the culture of the smoking cessation. And I know we're gonna talk about the smoking cessation, but unfortunately it's well known that a single question by the doctor or the clinician to the patients when they go into their office and a single engaging into the conversation, do you or would you smoke or have you a smoke? It is an amazing factor to decrease the number of people who smoke and, and it's been well proven. So simple as that, those are two effects. But again, even on those patients who have severe diseases, we can treat them. And, and if we catch them earlier on the disease, we definitely can make them uh, the lifespan significantly higher. Mortality on CPD has to be reduced. There's no question about it. There's no single treatment other than oxygen that reduces mortality for COPD patients, but the treatment itself reduces mortality. And again, this might, might look like a little bit of a, of a game of words, but it's not. It's just no single drug or no single medication will really reduce mortality. But if we treat patients with significant different act factors, whether it's medications, exercise, activity, oxygen, whatever is needed, the mortality is significantly reduced. And we know that for the last two decades. So, so good news for that. I, 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 I do want to address the benefits of quitting smoking at any time in the course of their illness, but let's now start getting into the 800 pound gorilla, which is tobacco and smoking. Um, so Javier, can you speak a little bit and, and folks, you know, we could spend three days on a seminar on any of these, these topics, but um, for the purposes um, uh, of this live cast, um, what does tobacco do? How, how dangerous is smoking <laughs> to our lungs? So, so smoking has two components and smoking has one is the, uh, the habit creating component, which is the nicotine. And the other is the really, the toxic products are delivered by the uh, smoking um, or the smoke inhalation. The nicotine addiction is one of the strongest addiction that we know in pharmacology. And so nicotine causes a significant degree of addiction that is very difficult to eliminate. And that's why smoking becomes a major factor for all the habits that we have in our societies. So addiction to nicotine requires help to quit. And, and unfortunately, it is well known that most people who quit require significant help because nicotine is a very potent drug and the delivery system goes directly to your brain. So it is a very, very, very direct interaction between the drug and your brain producing even more habit as we know by other drugs. Second aspect is the toxicity that's caused by the smoking inhalation. And, and the products delivered through the smoking uh, uh, by products, I will say, are as many as 6,000 different chemical toxics that are included in the smoke that is eliminated by a cigarette. And those for those who believe then, well, then the vapor or the smokeless tobacco, they might be good. Well, it's certainly not. And we already know that those also produce significant number of toxic elements because of the high temperatures that are uh, initiated to deliver the system and my other, other differences on there. So those two products, those two elements are very important to consider for smoking. And, and those are what really causes the significant damage by the smoke inhalation, of course. Okay. I think it's very important that the nicotine gives you pleasure when you first take it. But as your yep. brain becomes addicted, you have a plateau with nicotine and you feel terrible when you don't have it, which produces the nicotine. And also you said directly to the brain, it goes right through your cheeks. And as That's a cardiologist, because of course, smoking and nicotine is very bad for our cardiovascular system. Well, I don't inhale a cigar. That nicotine is going right through your cheeks into your brain. You don't need to get it into your lungs. That's so um, um, again, a couple of points now. So what does nicotine do to our lungs in terms of its relationship to lung cancer, uh, Mark? Well, it, uh, it's interesting. I, I'm going to uh, reiterate some facts um, that Javier talked about. And one of the most important issues nowadays is the use of vape uh, pens. And as... Um, Dr. Perez Fernandez indicated, nicotine is highly addictive. And these vape pens produce more nicotine per puff than a routine combustible cigarette. And that's important for the viewers to, to realize. And our young folks are thinking that these vape pens are safer, less addictive, um, and it's absolutely untrue. So if someone is using these vape pens, you need to realize that it's a highly addictive device. 
And if you go eventually to combustible smoke uh, instruments, uh, then you're going to be smoking combustible cigarettes at a higher rate and a higher frequency that's going to deliver these toxic chemicals to your lungs. Now, nicotine itself, we do not believe that it has any relationship to lung cancer. Lung cancer uh, develops in patients as a result of the six, six to 7,000 co-carcinogens and carcinogens that are released from the tobacco leaf. And it, tobacco smoke is not the only thing that is necessary in the alignment um, of, of the development of lung cancer. You have to have a genetic predisposition or some other element of viral infection that allows your genes to alter and grow un, un, unimpeded and grow un, exponentially into a tumor. So not everybody that smokes gets cancer, but a certain percentage, 10 to 20% we know are predisposed to developing cancer um, if they are smokers. And so it's very important to realize that. The other issue is that not all smokers um, or not, not all non-smokers don't get lung cancer. There is a significant percentage of, of um, people in this country, particularly women between the ages of 50 and 70 that are developing lung cancer for some reason that we're not quite sure why. So just because you're a non-smoker does not mean that you can't develop lung cancer. Well said. Nicotine is the addictive substance. Nicotine does have potent negative cardiac, cardiovascular components. The smoke and tars and all the other substances have direct lung damage. So many different levels, smoking is, is bad for you. And as you stated, vaping is not a safe alternative does have, especially with the nicotine components, risks as well. Um, and it can also be an entry that people think it's safe and they can wind up getting addicted to it as well. So I think that's well said. Um, so a couple of, couple of final points, again, in the interest of time. And again, I think uh, you guys are just wealth of information I'd love to dive deeper in. But um, smoking, again, bad, affects all parts of our body, addicting. What resources do we have or what do you connect smokers to to help them uh, quit smoking. Um, Javier, I'll, can, can, I, can I ask you that? Sure, sure. So we do have actually over Baptist, we have a Baptist health system. We have uh, two different uh, smoking cessation programs that our uh, our patients can um, go and, and, and definitely attend to different programs of education that we know. So so when you look into the historical uh, uh, data, it shows that when patients try to quit the smoking, they have significant difficulties doing so. And, and we know that the average number of attempts before a successful quitting attempt is, is seven. And that's actually the magic number that we know historically by all literature. Now, when we add to our counseling in the office as a physician, as a clinician, to the ability to provide the patient help with nicotine addiction, such as any nicotine substitution or any other medications that might help on that. And, and this is very important that you need to address this with your clinician. You cannot take anything over the counter because we know that's not successful, that it's only gonna do more harm than help. And as you already mentioned, nicotine is not exempt of cardiovascular effects. And the problem with the substitution is that when you substitute the nicotine of the cigarette with another product, whether it's a gun or whether it's a lozenge or whether it's whatever, that the problem is that those people who do not quit the smoking, they're using a significant increased amount of nicotine because they're using the substitution plus the cigarette. And that produces then problems that cannot be present on patients. So you always need to be oriented about this. You always need to be assessed by your clinician. So when we add to that, the ability to perform through the uh, smoking cessation program with education, sometimes through chat, sometimes a very hand-to-hand -hand, uh, evaluation, the success rate for quitting can be as high as 40%. That means almost every for every two patients that go into this program, one person is already smoking free after one year of being in this program. So it is very important that they address that and they can go to the website and they can look into uh, uh, the information on how to access, how to communicate with uh, uh, with our smoking cessation programs, but we offer that ability and that facility as well and our, our Baptist system. So the best way to avoid tobacco-related lung disease is to not smoke in the first place. If so, someone smokes, we recognize the addiction. No one is to be judged because you smoke, um, but don't give up. There are lots of resources available to, to work with you to help you quit smoking. Yes. Um, uh, I want to fi finish up with a couple of COVID um, um, comments. 
um, or at least uh, points. We know that um, we know to fix the lungs. We saw the early data and the images of people on ventilators, which I think we have, you know, a, a different ways of approaching it. Um, what do we know about COVID in the lungs, Javier? What have we learned? Uh, you were at the forefront in the Baptist Health System in the early days of of preparing and treating and and communicating worldwide. Give us a little bit of of where we're at with um, COVID related to lung disease. Are there long-term consequences? Whatever, whatever you want to tell our, our viewers. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I think it's important to summarize a little bit of our COVID experience over Baptist. Uh, at Baptist, we have uh, over 7,000 patients that we've treated with COVID since the beginning of the pandemic in the hospital, in the hospital. We had over 14,000 patients that we were able to manage at the emergency departments so or you can search and, and refer home safely through actually very sophisticated technology that we've used to follow those patients and monitor them at home. And we have a system set up for that. And we have telemedicine also to attend. Let me tell you a little bit about the experience with the patients in the hospital and it's been um, an, an amazing uh, learning curve for a lot of us. So uh, COVID is a viral disease that affects significantly the lung, mostly the lungs. And those patients who get complicated, the first organ failure that they have is the lung organ failure. So it's very important to realize that. And we we'll learn different things. Now, what we have not really completely mastered yet is the, is the decision whether this could be a chronic disease or not for some people. We learned, we heard, and um, we read some stories about people who have been, after a few months of being with COVID, they still have significant problems, but that's not enough to guarantee a chronic disease. We think that COVID affects people and in a self-acute way, it tends to weaken a little bit the system of the respiratory system. And that may be there for significant weeks or months. And in some cases, it might have actually highlighted problems that were baseline on those patients. And, and, but there is no certainty that really COVID produces chronic lung disease at this point. Very helpful. Um, so to summarize before a quick question, um, don't smoke if you're not smoking work to stop smoking if you are smoking, don't vape, um, and for similarly, stop if you are, exercise, get your flu vaccine and your, and your pneumonia vaccines, um, practice you know, healthy um, distancing, eat a healthy diet, get checkups with your primary care doctor, get the CT screening if you're eligible, as, as Dr. Deluski um, eloquently um, 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 uh, informed us, um, and there are smoking cessation programs available if, if you need to. So this is a, a great dialogue, a question from the audience. Um, maybe Mark, um, you can handle this. Um, how can nutrition support positive outcomes uh, um, arguably for this question for lung cancer? Well, I think, I think um, nutrition plays into a healthy lifestyle. And every physician and most of our viewers realize that a healthy lifestyle includes uh, proper nutritional intake and exercise, which strengthens your immune system and helps you fight off invaders such as COVID and, and cancer-related toxins and things like that. So I think it's important to focus on maintaining a healthy lifestyle and talking to a population who may, may or may not be smoking, the number one thing that you can do to improve your health and lengthen your longevity is not smoking. And if you are smoking, stop smoking. That's the number one best thing you can do for your health. On that final important message, um, uh, again, I think uh, I'd like to thank both you guys. Anything you want to add? Again, Mark, that was a great closing comment. Javier, other than saying, of course, um, no. um, anything you want I'm to add? Adhering to Mark's comment, so that's it. <laughs> okay, great. I, oh, really, I want to thank thing, you both. I have one other thing to add, please, uh, please. Dr. Yoko, is that when someone's told to, that they have an abnormality in their chest, it's so important that you seek proper advice. Every medical professional is not as experienced as Dr. Javier Perez or yourself or myself. And if someone's told that they have an abnormal finding on an x-ray, don't settle on one opinion. Get multiple opinions until you are absolutely certain that you've got the best opinion and you receive the best care. It's extremely important it, it, when it, it comes is. to lung cancer. Match the complexity of your problem to the skill set of the person taking care of you or right. evaluating you is of critical importance. So I think that's well said as well. So again, folks, um, um, I'd like to thank on behalf of Baptist Health South Florida, um, our, our guests for sitting down and talking to us about this important topic. I really appreciate your time. Remember folks, you can connect with us on social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and check out our resource blog for the latest news at baptisthealth.net uh, slash news. That's baptisthealth.net forward slash news. 
You'll find a link there for all the episodes of our Baptist Health podcasts. Some of the topics we discussed today have had pod podcasts with our Baptist experts. On behalf of Baptist Health, I um, ask you to stay safe, get your flu shots, and do your part to stop the spread of COVID. Mask up, South Florida. Find Thank additional you very much. valuable Thank health you. and wellness Thanks, information guys. on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. Resource Live is brought to you by Baptist Health South Florida. Healthcare that cares.